Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Big Mike has got the mic starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik, and today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome Josh Deshong. Hi, Josh. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for having me, my man. It's been it's uh, good to see you. Good to see you too. It's been it's been a while. Um, Josh hails from uh, Dallas, Texas. We met originally through the Collective Genius Mastermind, and Josh has a really cool. Um, uh, marketplace for wholesalers um, called uh, uh, Trolley, right? Trelly. Yeah, Trelly. Trelly is a marketplace for wholesaling. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, but before we, we, we dive there, tell us a little bit about you, your family. Uh, as I like to, to put it, you know, wife, kids, cats, pets, whatever <laughs> works for you. <laughs> yeah, um, awesome. So uh, my fiance and I, we have uh, we have two kids, a three year old and a nine year old. So I'm pretty much uh, going nonstop with between that and real estate. You know how it goes. Um, yeah, from Dallas, Texas, I've been in I've been in the investment space for 15 years. I actually I started in the in the real estate space as a real estate agent 15 years ago with Keller Williams and um, grew our team to one of the top real estate teams in the country, uh, top 10 Keller Williams teams. And um, and then in 2012, I started I started investing, Mike, and uh, I started buying fix and flip houses. You know, first year I bought two next year, I bought 30 and then it was over 100. And then uh, we we started scaling really fast, fixing and flipping, which turned into wholesaling and um, and we needed we needed a place to put all of our properties so our investors could find them uh, as well as just coordinating all the bids and all the questions and all that so so um, all of my experience kind of culminated into our marketplace trelly which is there to make wholesalers more money make uh, deal discovery easier for investors make investors more money because now they can they are buying from quality vetted wholesalers that they can trust right? That's really cool. Uh, first, first of all, share. Thank you for sharing about your family. It, it's always uh, it's always important. That gives us a why. So yeah, uh, and it's fascinating that you've um, I guess moved from real estate brokerage to you know fixer flipping to wholesaling. Wholesaling obviously it's a very different business. It's a lot more tax savvy, and I guess your platform is a technology platform. So yeah. let's talk a little bit more about uh, the platform. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, if someone um, is a wholesaler, they they have a market, I don't know, um, not, oh, Omaha, Nebraska, for sake of the argument. I don't know why I picked that, but just any market. And they want a wholesale there. Does your platform have um, uh, folks in that market uh, that um, uh, they can basically list their properties that they're trying to sell and you're going to have buyers for them? Is that the platform? Yeah. So in the, in the long term, in the long run, uh, Trelly is market agnostic, right? So you can have something uh, in, in the middle of Massachusetts and you can have something in the middle of North Dakota uh, that you want to sell off on. What we're doing is we're focusing. Um, so let me actually start over. The way it works is if you had a property uh, you wanted to, you wanted to sell off, let's say you're a wholesaler, you get a property under contract you go, uh, you would have to apply to be a seller on the platform. Once you become a seller, you would list the property on there and investors will bid against each other. It's kind of like eBay, right? So you'd set, all right, this, this property is available from this time to this time. People can bid against each other uh, on the property, or you can accept uh, like a first come first serve bid. Um, once you put the property out there, any investors who are likely to have interest uh, that have the app on their phone or that are on, that are signed up on their computer, they're going to get an email or a push notification letting them know that the property is available. And then we actually have an internal marketing team that's going to call any uh, interested buyers around that property and let them know that, hey, this is available on Trello. You should check it out. So we do all that curation, all the disposition curation um, for you. Now, we're brand new. So we're just releasing. And so uh, in the long term, you'll be able to do that anywhere. Today, we're only, we're only pushing the properties that are in Dallas, Houston, Tampa, and Jacksonville. Um, and in those markets, if you list a property, 
Uh, there is a marketing team that's going to be doing physical outreach. Uh, we have all types of investor analytics, so we can we can hit the right investor with the right opportunity. So long way of uh, answering that question, but uh, does that make sense, Mike? Yeah, it does. So you're focusing on certain markets. You're trying to be strong in those markets because you have to build the buyer's uh, list. You have to build the connections. Uh, are you integrated somehow with MLS? Is that connection? In other words, um, you don't have a connection because most people list on MLS. I mean, it's wholetailing, whatever you call that thing. Uh, I mean, this, you could, this classic wholesaling, if you have the, the, the equitable contract, you can list on MLS. Why do um, your platform versus an MLS? So I think there's a couple of a couple of things here. One is the MLS in most markets, a majority require that you have ownership. A wholesaler typically does not have ownership of the property when they're when they're um, uh, trying to market it and find a, a buyer to take it over. Um, number two, we've actually so we uh, we wholesale through our own platform. So so we're our own guinea pigs, and we've actually tested this to try to validate some of the ideas. And what we found was majority of the time, we actually sell the property on our platform for a better value than we actually do on the MLS. Um, and I think what happens there, we get more, more investor interest as well. And I think what happens there is investors aren't looking at the MLS. It's the, it, the time in, it takes right now, given how competitive the market is, you, investors can't beat the consumers. So the investors need a, a, a separate place to play that is specifically geared for them. It's kind of like, are you familiar with like the car auctions, Mike? A little bit, I guess. Uh, uh, I, yeah, it's not my business. So if you've seen yeah, yeah, car yeah, auctions right. on TV, when they, they they auction really expensive cars, you turn on one of these you know channels and it's a yeah, collectible yeah, yeah. Lamborghini, Lamborghini Countach and it's you know, people are bidding yeah. millions of dollars on that freaking thing. So different than those auctions, I'm talking about dealers have dealer to dealer auctions where they sell inventory for, for balance sheet issues. And so what we're doing is nothing similar than creating the, or nothing different than creating the dealer to dealer auction uh, marketplace. It's the secondary market where um, these business operators transact between each other. Right. So it's a dealer to dealer because the wholesale, wholesale buyers are also in the form of dealers. They're trying to get a deal. They're trying to get a property uh, at a discount, uh, but they didn't lock it up, but they still may be interested to buy it and do the rehab. And then, um, so you, you're yeah. basically looking up for, for you're looking at your ideal, I guess, candidates to be on the platform, people who do rehab and they're looking for properties who don't have the marketing engine to go find these properties, but they want the product because they have uh, the expertise is, is rehabbing. Yeah. Yeah, we classify everybody as an investor. And then it's, you know, wholesaler is an investor, a fix and flipper is an investor, a landlord, a head, an institutional hedge fund, all four are investors that that have use cases on each side of our platform, whether you're buying or you're selling. You know, a lot of investors now, Mike, with with the iBuyers, they're having to get very, very, you know, I mean, you you've got a fund. You have to have a, a thesis on what you're what you're investing in. This is my buy box. This is what I'm investing in. And if it's outside of that, a lot of investors, your fix and flippers, are starting to wholesale, right? They're starting to say, "Oh, this is outside of my buy box. I need to sell this deal off. Where do I go?" They don't necessarily have the disposition engine or the disposition arm. So those investors would go to somebody like or a, a, a place like Trelli, and they'd put that excess deal flow on there and sell it off. So, so you can be a wholesaler on the supply side, you can be an investor flipper on the supply side, or you can, you can be a flipper or a landlord on the demand side, either way. Yeah, it makes total sense. I, I guess you, 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 you need to expand into multiple markets. I mean, that's kind of my observation that you, you want to get better at current markets, go deeper, but at the yeah. same time, uh, the value of the platform increases geometrically if you, if you get a greater penetration for the reason that you, you're limited to only to the folks in specific markets. Now, uh, you, you're playing with big markets. That's the good news, right? Dallas, Houston, Jacksonville, and you said Tampa, right? Yes. Yeah, these are fairly large markets, and um, you probably have enough buyers and sellers. So um, do you have any plans to grow into other markets at this point? Uh, and what markets? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to North Carolina in the next 12 months. Uh, we're going to be expanding the Texas market. So we'll be hitting Austin and San Antonio as well. Um, uh, we're looking at some of the Midwest and some of the West Coast markets right now. We're, we're kind of investigating what makes a market work. And, and we're trying to understand, you know, how many how many buyers and sellers are necessary to, to make the make a market get off the ground. Yeah, you need a critical mass in, in, in any market. If you don't have enough critical mass, people waste their time, you know, putting stuff on a platform or looking for the deals on a platform when you don't have any deals. So it's almost like, <laughs> yeah, you, if you don't get the critical mass, you need to give people free opportunity to list, free opportunity to buy until they get, you know, get the critical mass, and then you could charge whatever you charge for. Well, what do you charge? Just, just, just curious. Uh, when is it a commission, like a real estate commission? Today we don't charge anything. Today, oh, you're, you're just you're just promoting you're growing the platform. Yeah, we just want it. We just want to get people using it. And we want to bring as much value to the to the buyers and sellers using the platform as possible. And so today, we're we're actually not charging anything. I can't say that we'll we'll be free forever, but uh, today it's free in the markets we're operating in. Very cool. Yeah, I guess folks can try out. If they get a result, great. If they don't, doesn't cost them anything. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the one danger of being uh, free is that it's you always perceived as uh, you get what you pay for sometimes. Uh, so, so you, you may want to charge something but give people a discount a, because, you know, you, you're starting six months for free or 12 months for free. I, I probably, that's only my two cents feedback. Uh, don't make it free, but, you know, here's a price, but we'll give you the first six months or first 12 months, uh, at, you know, for one dollar introductory price or something like that so you know our first initial users we told them we said hey uh we're, we're charging you in feedback right we want we we want you to tell us what what you don't like what you hate and we want you to be mean mean to us and that that is currency uh today and then you know we're going to continue to introduce friction and um and just trying to make sure the quality of the sellers on our platform is high um that's and matters, right just to, it doesn't even turn into a facebook group yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's you don't turn into Facebook now. Now nobody is using Facebook. I don't know what happened. It was like a it was a big platform, and now it's like if I if I log into Facebook, it's just I'm forcing myself to log in because I don't really do anything there. Yeah, it's the the name change. I blame the name change. Uh, I don't know. I think it's just so much noise that happens from the platform. I only keep it so that way if I get a message from somebody, for, you know, that's the only reason I still have it. Yeah, honestly, I do the same thing. Um, like CG people still post and I post from time to time. That's the only reason I'll get it is it's like there's a response from a CG uh, fellow yeah. and I have to go respond or take a look. But other than that, it's don't really do much there. But back to your platform. So before we dive, dive deep, uh, what's the website? Like how would folks um, reach it? And you said you have a mobile app, right? If I understood yeah. correctly. Yeah, so you can download it in uh, the Android or Apple App Store. Um, it's Trelly, T-R-E-L-L-Y, or you can go to the website, T-R-E-L-L-Y.com. Gotcha. Very cool. I mean, I, 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 this is a very cool idea. Good luck with, with the platform. Yeah. It is sort of like, it feels like it's a, it's in a beta test type of mode, which years ago, before real estate, I was in the software. Ah. Very familiar uh, with uh, some of the software development concepts, and you get a prototype out. You certainly uh, pilot, put it in the beta test. Uh, yes, the feedback is more appreciated than any kind of payment. So then you have to pay people to do uh, a beta test for you. So, yep, that's, but, a, that's, a, that's effectively our value exchange at this at this stage right now, Mike. You're exactly right. Makes sense. Um, Let's just switch the subject a little bit. And again, you're in Dallas market. You're actually wholesaling, right? Um, yeah. And you, you you said you're also wholesaling in other markets that, um, you know, Houston, Tampa, and uh, Jacksonville. So here is the, the question. Uh, what do you see happening right now? Just curious from your observation. Um, we are coming, you know, into the spring uh, at this point. And usually spring is a pretty strong market. Uh, we, you know, we saw great appreciation in 2021, um, the shortage, the supply demand, the, everything else, uh, the inventories, all those things have been in a weird equi equilibrium that has pushed the prices up, right? It's not necessarily all driven by uh, the fact that there is not enough supply, but it's a mix of things, right? It's just supply demand, uh, new product, old product. 
So where are we going? What do you see? You see prices still um, growing at a pretty good pace in 2022. Uh, what's your observation, prediction? Your, what does your crystal ball say? Yeah, I think I think that it's a great question. I would love to know for sure uh, that my thoughts are accurate. So I'll say that first. But um, it's interesting. You know, inventory levels are very low. They're, they're at historic lows. Now, historic um, in many parts of the country is 2016. So our inventory levels were, were very low in 2016. Um, and so in, in some parts of the country, we're at record low levels and some other parts uh, we're actually not. So, um, you know, inventory being low is definitely an issue and that's going to continue to cause values to rise. Um, I don't see there's too much institutional demand um, into the residential housing market. I don't see prices coming down being a real risk, but um, in appreciation of real estate, it's already slowed. Right. So we're talking about, is it going to slow down for this year? It's already happened. Um, I think real estate, the demand has gotten to a point where um, it just can't go over any further. Um, Why? Is this a question of affordability? Obviously, there is substantial fear of interest rate hikes. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know, you know what's going to happen to the long term rates, which create, which drive mortgage rates. Um, but the short-term rates are certainly going up with the Fed projecting number of uh, increases and all the data is, point, is pointing to probably, you know, 100 basis points, maybe even more increase this year. Uh, and the Fed is always late, but they, they've put the fear, um, fear of God, the interest rate God uh, uh, rising. And, and um, uh, is that the, the affordability now the issue? We're reaching sort of peak affordability in many markets. I'm just curious because it's always supply yeah. and demand. It's always, yes, the institutional buyers are still coming in, but their yield is low. Like, I don't know if they're meeting their yield requirements. Then you've got kind of the owner-occupied people who want to live, the primary residence type of buyers. And uh, when the prices are way ahead of the income growth, right, it becomes a challenge to buy because afford it, it all comes down to affordability. And the underwriting, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac underwriting is pretty strict. There's a box. If you don't fit into the box, you can't buy, you can't pay the price. So, yeah, and I would think I, I would add, I would add additional something else to it that wasn't a factor, say, 10 years ago. And that is, um, so affordability and yield are almost uh, opposite of each other, so to speak, right? So, um, you know, what happened in 2020 in April, May, June, we were selling homes like crazy to institutions, uh, to large scale buyers. Um, because everybody's affordability was in question, but yield went through the roof. Um, yields went through the roof on rental properties in 2020. And so we, we started selling property after property after property to institutions um, to pick up all the excess. People were, were panicking. They were panic selling in, in the very beginning of 2020. Now what's happened is um, household incomes have actually started going up in the, the last 12 months. Um, we've seen affordability has, has started to work out. Interest rates are going to start rising um, and that is reducing the amount of yield that can be achieved. So you're actually seeing a little bit of a pullback on the, from the institutional investors as of late. Um, and we're seeing a little bit more from, from the retail crowd. So I think that we're going to have this continuous equilibrium from, from uh, institutional investors and the retail crowd kind of com, uh, competing for this, this asset class. If the asset class falls too low, um, you know, if the, if, the, uh, if the values fall, one of the two is, end up, is going to end up breaking and absorbing that additional supply, right? So our, our existing supply levels would have to grow, you know, 20, 30x. Um, and our demand would have to fall by 50% plus for us to even have a, a real uh, housing crisis type of an issue. Do you, does that make sense? From Yeah, it does. There's, there's, what you're uh, alluding to is substantial shortage of, of housing, especially affordable housing. And um, the supply is just not coming up fast enough. And the other major issue today is the uh, supply chain is is causing problems creating new supply. If you can't right. get the supply, you can't finish the product, you can't deliver the product. So uh, that is is a big driver of potential shortage of inventories. On the other side, yeah, it, it's a good point that the 
competition between institutional i buyers um, and, and i buyers. You know, let's just differentiate. They are just portfolio yeah. buyers and i buyers, yeah. institutional players, institutional dollars versus your um, retail. Uh, well, either retail investor or uh, owner occupied is, is it's an interesting balance. Uh, but the interest rate increases are hurting both, no matter how you look at it. It's either hurting affordability um, uh, of the um, uh, owner-occupied, uh, the debt-to-income ratio, right? Which is the simple, simple math, yeah. right? Yeah. There's a high sensitivity of the payment to the interest rate increases. Even quarter, half a percent increase on a very on top of a very low interest rate can increase the payment substantially. So interest rate increase uh, now. When the rates were six percent, a quarter increase wasn't a big deal. When, when the interest rates are below three percent, and you increase it by a quarter, you're almost increasing ten percent. It's it's eight percent, ten percent increase. It's a very substantial increase in the payment, right? That that's kind of a basic observation. And then on the um, on the investor side, it's the same thing. It hurts the yield, right? Whether it's an individual investor getting an investment loan or it is an institutional investor. Um, leveraging some kind of financing option. Uh, so the the yield on equity is coming down. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, that's what, uh, that's what. Well, well, rents, but remember rents and household income are both rising drastically and that could offset the yield, um, the yield issues. Now, don't get me wrong. Yields are going to drop. That's in, on like, it makes total sense, but there's a lot of other factors going into play that your net yield might not actually be as 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 bad as you might think, right? Yeah, I yeah. concur with you 100%. I mean, this is the reason this type of an asset class is a great hedge against inflation, especially affordable housing range, uh, is because of the ability to increase rents with inflation. I mean, that, that's that's the holy grail. I've had this conversation not only with single family product, but with number of multifamily, um, very substantial. Um, investors, operators, sponsors, and the thesis is still the same, uh, that uh, the ability to increase rents will will continue to be there with inflation. And uh, we're seeing classic inflation when there is income inflation, not just the, the cost inflation, which is a big deal, which is the, the way you think about this, right? Inflation, people think of inflation is you have 10 apples, 10 oranges. I, I, sorry, 10 apples and 10 dollars. We've talked about this, right? It, it's a pretty classic concept where, um, when you have a shortage of uh, apples and more dollars, the price per apple goes up. Well, on the other hand, if you increase um, incomes, uh, which is basically dollars, more dollars in the pocket, and that's what that's what's creating the continuous ability to pay higher rents and pay higher prices. So, I'm on the same page with you. So, I, I would I would say that as much as the interest rates creating fear uh, in affordability, on the other side, it's also uh, an indication that the Fed is seeing inflation and they're raising interest rates not because they got nothing else to do; it's got no choice. So inflation uh, is happening out there. As long as um, uh, labor um, can, can you know, folks can make more money, they, yeah. they can afford to pay higher. Yeah, um, I, I, I think I, I was going to throw this out there. One of the big, big examples I like to refer to. Everyone's like, you know, once interest rates go down home prices are going to fall. Once interest rates go up, home prices are going to fall. And, and you know, basic economics, economic theory says that would be, would be the case. But if you think about the 80s, right, when interest rates went through the roof, housing prices didn't really fall. And it was because the, the circumstances were different. They weren't, it wasn't the housing crash of 08, right? It was uh, people didn't have to sell. So if they weren't able to get what they wanted, they're like, well, I'll just stay here and I'll put my life on hold for six months until the, the right time comes around. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I'm actually very confident. Uh, I'm very confident in the housing market. I, th I think I actually think that the, the housing market is more stable than probably ever before. Yeah, I happen to agree with you. You know, my my two cents um, is that the uh, the stocks and the, the kind of the stock market and a lot of mutual funds uh, have a higher degree of risk related to that than the real estate yep. investing because they they have very leveraged balance sheets that are more sensitive to the interest rate increases. Uh, real estate is is heavily leveraged, but it's mostly leveraged with long term, relatively cheap debt and. When the interest rates uh, rise, the yeah, ability to refi um, uh, gets more difficult. Um, some acquisitions, new acquisitions, could could get a little bit harder. 
but at the same time, you know, back to the basics that um, inflation is a friend. Inflation is probably one of the best friends of real estate. It's a real asset and it's a great hedge against inflation, especially during the uh, cost-driven inflation. The, the, the delta between um, 2008 and now, 2008 crisis, we didn't see the costs of construction being very high, uh, at least not, not going up as fast as they're going up now. Right. So the, the cost justification of the price the reconstruction cost uh, was not as high. And there was a lot of speculation. Pure people were paying higher and higher prices on pure speculation versus the real cost to reconstruct. Now, it's not a, it's not a speculation anymore, not the same way, because uh, if it costs more to build a new home and you're buying a, um, a used home or used home, an existing home, not a new one, um, uh, it's just expensive to reconstruct. So the substitution yeah. effect is, is still there. Anyway, um, appreciate Absolutely. your wisdom. Any final um, uh, parting thoughts um, uh, on the market? Uh, maybe a couple of final word, words about uh, your platform. Uh, yeah. uh, what would you like the folks to do if they're interested? If somebody's listening, should they go? Should they? How would they reach out to you? Just go on a website. Yeah. Or is there another way to reach out? Yeah, go to trelly, uh, trelly.com. Uh, you can contact via there. You're welcome to email me directly, josh at trelly.com. If you're looking to get into wholesaling or, or fix and flipping or adding wholesaling to your business, I'd love to talk to you and love to love to see how I can help. So, Thank you, Josh. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. appreciate you sharing and good luck with the platform. Hope it Thanks, becomes brother. a big success. Good seeing you, my man. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. You too. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.